Well, welcome everybody. I'm John Hinderocker, president of Center of the American Experiment. Thanks for participating in our uh, in our webinar today. Our panelists are Isaac Orr, who's a policy fellow at American Experiment, specializing in energy and, and uh, natural resources, and Debbie Struzacher. Uh, Debbie is a certified professional geologist with the American Institute of Professional Geologists and is one of the top experts in the country on environmental regulation and, and compliance as it relates to the uh, mining industry. Um, we're gonna jump in here in just a moment. If you, if you have a question at any time during today's presentation, if you just hover, hover over the bottom part of your Zoom screen, uh, you'll see a chat option pop up. And if you click on that, uh, you should get a sidebar and you can type a question uh, into the chat function. We might interrupt a time or two if there are questions uh, asking for clarification of something that a panelist says. Otherwise, we'll wait until the presentation is done and then we'll, uh, then we'll, go, to, uh, we'll go to questions. So with that, Isaac and Debbie, please uh, take it away. All right, gladly. I'm just going to share my screen here and we can uh, get this show on the road. Perfect. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in to the presentation. What can mining do for Minnesota? Um, yeah, this is a picture of the mine view up in uh, Hibbing, Minnesota. You have the nice truck there on the sunset. So thanks for the Iron Mining Association for letting us use this picture. Uh, so just our presenters for the day, Debbie, do you want to elaborate on John's introduction of yourself at all? Well, just very briefly, John, thank you for that very uh, generous um, invitation. It's my great pleasure to be with you today and talk a little bit about the uh, regulations for mining in Minnesota and why those regulations ensure that any future mines are going to be uh, very protective of the environment. I've got a lot of experience working on mining projects throughout the country and can assure your uh, viewers here today that uh, Minnesotans should be very, very proud of the uh, mining regulatory program that you have in your state because it is truly effective and comprehensive. All right, that is great. And as for myself, uh, my name is Isaac Orr. I write basically every day something new on the website about the uh, energy and environmental workings uh, that are going down in the capital. Um, you know, uh, we are going to be sharing the results of our new research. So uh, Debbie was instrumental in helping us write our initial report on mining uh, called Unearthing Prosperity, How Environmentally Responsible Mining Will Boost Minnesota's Economy. So my role in that report was to look at what's the economic impact of developing all of Minnesota's uh, copper, nickel, titanium, cobalt, and uh, Platinum, no, uh, yeah, platinum, obviously, but I think I'm missing titanium. Nickel. So I apologize if I've said it twice. Um, and to also just kind of give people a basic background information of why are these minerals important to our daily lives? That was the first 15 pages. The next 30 pages was all Debbie. Uh, Debbie, why don't you tell us a little bit about the hard work that you put into that initial report? Well, thanks, Isaac. Uh, again, it was really wonderful working with the center on this uh, project and uh, yes, there is a lengthy discussion in this uh, unearthing prosperity about Minnesota's regulations for mining, why they are so comprehensive, the kinds of things that they require as far as um, environmental baseline data to understand the project and to select the technologies that are needed to protect the environment, um, the kinds of work that Minnesota regulators have done um, understanding how uh, rocks in the area that we're going to be talking about interact with the environment. You truly have world-class scientists with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources who are recognized experts in the field of predicting mine waste geochemistry. Um, so the report talks about that a little bit. And the report also gives two real-world examples of projects located in um, geographic and climatic settings not, diff not substantially different from Minnesota, uh, one in Michigan and one in uh, Wisconsin, two mines um, that are the, the Wisconsin mine that operated in an environmentally responsible way and it has now been reclaimed to an industrial park and a wonderful nature preserve. 
and the mine in Michigan that is currently operating and is really a paradigm of environmental responsibility. So if any of your viewers want some real specific information about the breadth and depth of Minnesota's mining regulations, it's all there in that report. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, the, the original report is definitely worth reading for, for those perspectives. And the, the reason we're doing the webinar today is we've recently updated the um, original report to be more of a companion report because um, every year, um, well, basically what happens is uh, when companies decide that they're going to try and do more drilling for determining how much you know, copper and nickel is in the ground, they'll produce mineral estimates. And we've had more mineral estimates become publicly available uh, which changes the equation in terms of how many jobs could this impact or create, how much economic activity could this have. And considering that there was a, a large uh, mineral deposit that got these new mineral estimates, we thought it was time to update our report and flesh out the story of mining in Minnesota a little more. And that's what led to the updated uh, version of it. So uh, the four main takeaways today are that Minnesota has some of the largest copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, cobalt, and titanium ore reserves uh, that are not being developed in the entire world. Uh, developing these resources could create up to 14,850 new jobs, generate 5.9 billion with a B in uh, GDP for the economy. And that would actually create $370 million in state and local tax revenue every single year. So we'll see that uh, more in a later slide. And it's important to know that we can do that without harming the environment. We can do both. We can have mining and be environmental stewards. Uh, and also just to let people know that obstacles exist uh, that can prevent Minnesota from realizing these massive opportunities. So uh, Minnesota mining past, present and future. Uh, I feel like people used to know more about the mining industry in Minnesota because they had relatives that worked in the mines. Uh, and as we've become more of like a suburban culture, I grew up on a dairy farm. So I, I gripe about people that think milk comes from the store. Um, but uh, we kind of think that people just think minerals just appear. So uh, in the old days, we had the original hematite mines in uh, Minnesota. Now we do taconite mines in the middle. Um, and now in the future, we're going to have copper and nickel mining. And on the, the right there, there is a picture of the Twin Metals Minnesota facility. Uh, so just for some background, Minnesota is already the fourth largest producer of non-fuel minerals. So that's basically anything that isn't coal, oil, or natural gas or uranium in the United States. Uh, and we could have been first if we had been developing our copper and nickel resources and given uh, Debbie's home state of Nevada a run for their money. Uh, we produced 85% of America's iron ore last year. Most of the rest of it came from upper Michigan and mining supported about uh, 11,600 jobs according to a study from UMD, uh, University of Minnesota Duluth. So. Uh, Debbie, how do you feel about Minnesota knocking off your home state as the uh, number one producer? Well, I'd say, Isaac, game on. Sure. Uh, Nevada is the largest producer of minerals right now because of our gold mining industry. Uh, if Nevada were a country, Nevada would be the fourth or fifth largest gold producing country in the world. And the uh, most of the gold mines are located in northern Nevada. If you've ever traveled through Nevada on Interstate 80, they're located kind of on either side of, of Interstate 80. And um, they are absolutely essential to the economies of Northern Nevada. Uh, similar to Minnesota, the gold mines in Nevada employ about 14,000 people and they are high paying jobs. Um, so the gold mining industry is a really important component of Nevada's economy. And I'll just, one other thing to note from this slide in general is that the US is blessed with a very important mineral endowment. And it's essential for us to develop those minerals, whether they're located in Minnesota or Nevada or other states in the environmentally responsible way in which modern mines currently operate. Uh, development of all of those domestic resources would reduce our reliance on foreign sources of minerals, which Isaac's going to talk about a little bit and uh, would make important contributions to the economies of many states. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, when we talk about uh, Minnesota's mineral deposits, we're really talking about the Duluth complex. And this is a, a large rock formation. And you see all of these little gold blobs, for lack of a better term, on the screen, the Masaba, the North Met, the Wet Lakes. 
these are the mineral deposits that companies are looking to deposit. The one, the deposits that contain the copper, the nickel, the platinum, and the palladium. Um, and we've known about these deposits since the 1950s, but uh, recently, what's happened globally is the amount of metal that's in all of the ores falls over time as companies prioritize higher grade mineral deposits. So the Duluth deposit, you know, people say, well, that's been there forever. We know that it's not any good and we don't need to mine it. And, you know, that isn't true anymore. The, the amount of metal that is in these deposits is actually on par with, you know, the deposits that are being mined globally. And, you know, people used to think there was no oil in North Dakota that you could access. And now it's the second largest uh, oil producing state in the country. So it's really a matter of like, do we have the technology? And that is kind of the main determining factor on whether it makes sense to develop a natural resource. Uh, and Minnesota has some of the largest natural res resources, not only in the world, but when you look at what that means for the United States, we have 34% of the copper reserves in the, um, in the United States. We have I just wanted to make sure I was saying reserves and not resources because they're technically different. Uh, we have 95% of the nickel, 88% of the cobalt, 50% of the platinum and palladium, and 90% of the iron ore. So the United States is the largest producer or consumer of these metals in the entire world, but we're still importing a lot of them. We import most of our nickel, most of our cobalt, we produce almost no co cobalt, and we import a lot of our copper as well. Uh, so Developing these minerals in Minnesota is absolutely crucial if we want to make the United States more self-sufficient uh, from a, you know, how, where do we source our, the metals and minerals that we use every single day? Would you like to elaborate on that at all, Debbie? Well, the um, U.S. Geological Survey publishes every year a mineral commodities summary that shows the country's reliance on critical minerals and on, on, on all minerals, actually. And we have over 100% reliance on about half of the minerals that have been formally designated as critical. And unfortunately, the countries upon whom we rely are often uh, not our allies. Uh, China and Russia, for example, are some of the largest mineral exporting countries. Um, China is one of the main sources of rare earth minerals. Rare earths are um, essential in developing the batteries that go into wind turbines. So for those who want to see more renewable energy in this country, we've got to deal, we've got to have access to rare earth minerals. And right now, China has controls that market and they control the processing of it as well. So there are uh, serious national security and national economic issues that are associated with our reliance on foreign minerals. Um, President Trump has developed two executive orders trying to uh, decrease our reliance on foreign minerals. And we can certainly hope that those, <clears throat> excuse me, initiatives will survive into the next administration. Perfect. Yeah, so just to show how big these minerals are on a global scale, uh, the Duluth complex is the fourth largest uh, nickel deposit in the world. And really it's the third largest because you have 15 of the largest nickel deposits in Western Australia grouped together in this chart. Uh, so behind uh, Russia and Canada, Minnesota is right there. Um, and then for copper deposits, we have the first or second largest deposit in contained copper. And the World Bank estimates that we're going to need uh, more copper in the next 25 years than we've mined in the last 4,000 years. Um, so if we don't mine on Minnesota or in Minnesota, we will need to get these minerals from somewhere. Um, and that is going to be somewhere else. Um, and you know, it's really important to think about not only the national security aspects of this, and I think that that's, you know, very important, but it's also like, what are the ethical considerations? What are the environmental considerations that go into effect when we don't take the uh, initiative ourselves to do the best job of developing these resources in an environmentally responsible way? Uh, production shifts to places like the Congo, uh, where you know as many as 40,000 kids are mining cobalt by hand and washing the ore in the rivers. So it's an inconvenient truth for people that want you know, an all electric future and wind turbines and solar panels. Uh, most of those people don't wanna mine in Minnesota either. So if you don't mine in Minnesota where the protections for workers and the environment are strong, that, that production is gonna go somewhere else where they don't care as much about the environment or their workers. Isaac, I would just add that the uh, World Bank's projections for the increased demand for copper 
are driven largely by the uh, use of copper in electrical vehicles. An electric vehicle consumes about 40% more copper than a conventional vehicle. So here again, um, you know, the, uh, a, a renewable energy future absolutely demands many, many mined uh, minerals. And it, we have resources of those minerals uh, and it would be best for us to develop them here. Absolutely. Uh, so let's look at the, the findings from the new paper, Updating Prosperity. This is really the crux of the, the update. Um, so the annual economic impact of expanded mining in Minnesota, it's 14,850 new jobs and more than $1 billion in new wages annually. So the way that this gets broken up is between direct jobs, indirect jobs, and induced jobs. And, you know, I'm sounding like John Phelan too much, and I don't like that. Um, without the accent, without the fun British accent that makes me sound authoritative. Um, so direct jobs are jobs directly in the mining industry. So um, that would be 4,667 jobs directly in the mining industry. Indirect jobs are jobs that are in the, you know, they're servicing the, um, the direct jobs, right? So this is going to be suppliers to the mining industry, diesel mechanics, that sort of stuff, contractors that come in to work at the mines. Uh, so that would be 4,912 jobs. And then induced jobs is the number of jobs that are created by, you know, miners and mechanics spending their paychecks in the broader economy. That's bakeries, that's schools, that's hospitals. Um, you know, when a mine closes down in northeastern Minnesota and people leave the area, those students leave the school and the school gets less funding. So, you know, there's a lot of induced impacts that happen that are so, you know, tied to the mining industry that people don't think about right away. Um, and this would increase Minnesota's GDP by $5.9 billion uh, every single year. And not only that, but I want to talk about this in terms of tax revenue too. So uh, according to Implan, which is the economic modeling software that we use, it's the same software that the University of Minnesota would use, uh, expanded mining would produce uh, nearly $370 million in new state and local tax revenues every single year. It would also increase money for the school trust fund. So iron ore mines have contributed about a billion dollars towards the school trust fund. It's 95% of the revenue in that trust fund. And last year, or for the 2021 school year, uh, this trust fund distributed $37 million for education, right? So about $43.50 per student. Uh, so Twin Metals and another mine, according to the Department of Natural Resources, could add about $2.5 billion to this trust fund. So you know, if you look at 37 million, that's about 3.7% of 1 billion. Uh, so if you look at it that way and assume it's just 3.7% of the trust fund gets distributed, uh, the trust fund could theoretically distribute $130 million or $150 per student. So if you've got a class of 20 students that adds up really quickly to uh, more money for schools. And the other thing that's important to think about those 4,660 or 70 direct jobs is that they're very good paying jobs. Uh, mining jobs are some of the highest paying jobs in the state. Uh, this graph is made from data produced or, you know, gathered by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it shows that mining jobs, you know, they pay about $98,000 per year. Uh, that's more than the average job in Hennepin County, uh, which is 73, which is still much higher than the state average. But when you look at that, it's, it's more than twice the average annual wage for St. Louis County, where the mining occurs. And it's about 5.6 times higher than tourism jobs, uh, the wages paid by tourism jobs. So, you know, there's this friction between environmental groups that don't like mining and pro mining factions sometimes because the environmentalists say, well, we should just do tourism jobs instead of mining. And uh, we'll, we'll explain a little bit why that's kind of a false dichotomy to begin with. You do, it's not an either or uh, proposition, but you can see why people would choose a tour or a, a mining job over a tourism job given the given the um, choice. And also, this is great. This is from a University of Minnesota Duluth study. Uh, Forty percent of the jobs in the mining industry are held by people with a high school diploma. Uh, about seventeen percent are held by people with an associate's degree. Seven percent with a certification. Thirty-one percent with a bachelor's degree. So you're in it, you're empowering you know, 40% of this workforce who has a high school education to make a really good wage that allows them to buy a house, save for their own kids, college fund if they want to. Um, so really this is economic mobility 
uh, for people that, you know, don't have the desire to go on and get a higher education. And, you know, that's the foundation for building future wealth. So um, really, when you're talking about mining jobs, it's, it's really about creating more opportunities for not only the people who are working in there, but their kids and their grandkids. And I just think that that fact gets lost on a lot of people that don't have a, you know, a family member that's from the range. Uh, so let's talk about mining jobs versus tourism jobs, because, you know, people in Hennepin County are more likely to be against mining. Uh, and they're, you know, it's easy for them to kind of be against it because they're already making $73,000 a year. Um, and, you know, the problem with tourism jobs is a lot of them are seasonal. Uh, I took this picture in my hometown of Wapaka, Wisconsin. And uh, this is Moe's Chicago Dogs. We get a lot of people from Illinois that come up to Wapaka to enjoy the lakes. And it just says the last two days, Saturday and Sunday, September 8th and 9th. This picture is a few years old. Uh, but, you know, between Labor Day and Memorial Day, the tourism industry really drops off. And uh, that's just not something that people think about when they say, oh, well, we should just have tourism. You know, people need jobs year round. And the opponents who cite, you know, or who say, you know, we need more tourism jobs, we don't need more mining jobs. Uh, they cite a letter by economist Harvard or Harvard economist John Stock. And we'll talk about why that letter had some problems later on. Uh, but really, I want to just kind of hit on this basic fact uh, mining is essential and tourism isn't. Uh, in a year where we've actually had the governor produce a list of essential and non-essential jobs, uh, mining was on that list and a lot of the jobs that are associated with uh, tourism were not. So you had restaurants closed down, you had basically anything that wasn't absolutely essential being told, hey, we need to shut down for the virus. And really metals and minerals are important to our lives as anything else, food, water, air, shelter, in fact, that's how we make most of our shelters is with these minerals. Uh, so in, in contrast, tourism is something we partake in if we're privileged enough to afford it. So um, when you look at this graph, and this is from the Minnesota Department of Employment, um, MDEED, uh, Phelan knows what the acronym is. I know what the acronym is, or stands for. I just know what it is. Uh, food and beverage service was the top uh, industry that had layoffs in Northeastern Minnesota. You also had uh, retail workers, cooks, food preparation workers, and you know the mines had layoffs too, absolutely. Um, there was a shutdown in Michigan for the auto industry and that reduced the demand for metal. Um, but you know that just kind of shows that you need both. Uh, in order to have the strongest possible economy in Northeastern Minnesota, you need to have both. And they're really, it's a symbiotic relationship and not an antagonistic one. So uh, Debbie, how about, uh, I mean, you live in Nevada. It's a very tourism dependent state. Uh, why don't you kind of walk us through what's happened there as a result of COVID and, you know, just in terms of how the mines have been impacted and how tourism has been impacted. Okay, um, certainly. Well, Nevada's economy has been devastated by COVID. Um, Nevada and Hawaii actually share the characteristic of having a very significant economic reliance on the tourism industry. Uh, Nevada's governor sh uh, closed the casinos for about six weeks um, earlier this year. They are now back up and running, but at a very reduced capacity uh, with a lot of COVID safety um, protocols in place. But throughout that period, the uh, mines in Nevada continued to operate. Um, they certainly had to you know, come operate under some very stringent COVID protection pr criteria, but they continue to employ people. I'm not aware of any significant layoffs in any of Nevada's uh, mining operations. And so what that meant for the counties in particular and where the mines are located is that there was no significant drop off in tax revenue or employment um, or those, you know, indirect and induced um, boost to the economy that uh, Isaac mentioned. Also, I think it's worthy of noting that um, a, several of Nevada's largest uh, gold mining companies contributed substantially to the local economies um, with monetary donations during COVID to try to assist the communities. Uh, Nevada Gold Mines, for example, has contributed over, I believe it is $5 million to the local economies where they have where they have operations just to try to help people during this really challenging time. 
the gold prices spike to record highs as well um, to keep the mines going. All right. All right. So let's talk about the Harvard study that was not actually a study. So um, a lot of people take to the Star Tribune and say, well, this Harvard study says that uh, tourism is going to be a better way forward. Uh, but it was actually a personal letter written on Harvard letterhead uh, from a professor, Jim Stock. Uh, John, do you want to inform the audience about your uh, invitation to have Professor Stock come and talk with us? Yeah, I read this letter and, you know, I practiced law for 41 years, did litigation all around the country. I cross-examined hundreds of expert witnesses, might have gone into the thousands. I never had an expert in one of my cases write a report as bad as this one. It is so full of holes, it's ridiculous. So I wrote to Jim Stock and I challenged him to debate me on the merits of his letter versus your report, Isaac and Debbie. And I gave him 60 or 70 dates on which I was available. And I said, take your pick. I'll debate you on any of these days at a location of your choosing. And he wrote back and said he was really sorry, but he was tied up on all of those days and was not going to be, uh, going to be willing to debate me on the merits of this, frankly, very silly letter. So that was my experience with Mr. Stock. It was just fun to say you invited him for 60 different days and it just didn't work out. Um, but really, uh, the, the fact that this isn't a study or a peer reviewed study that was ever submitted to a journal isn't as important as the fact that a lot of the assumptions in this study and the ones we're going to talk about are just bad. Um, so what it does is it manufactures costs for mining while ignoring the benefits. And we're going to talk about that right now. So. Um, Mining jobs obviously pay a lot higher wages than tourism jobs. We've seen this in the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, job or you know graph that I showed you earlier. Sorry, I stumbled over my words there. Uh, but every mining job creates about 1.13 induced jobs because there's so much extra money flowing through the economy, whereas every tourism job supports about 0.2 additional jobs. So when you're looking at this from an induced jobs perspective, uh, a mining job is going to support a lot more induced jobs than a tourism job would. And really what the stock letter did is it just ignored the impact of induced employment altogether. So it said, well, we're not going to count it for tourism and we're not going to count it for mining. But really, when you look at it, that's not a fair assessment because one of the biggest impacts of uh, mining on employment is the fact that you have uh, induced jobs that are created as you know people spend money in the broader economy. And, you know, it helps to perf like look at these people in terms of like real people, real examples. Uh, so this is Pep's Bake Shop. It's a bakery in Virginia, Minnesota that uh, my girlfriend and I visited last February. Uh, and as you walk up to the door, there's a sign on it that says, we support our steel workers. And, uh, you know, we just went in there for donuts and we started chatting and you know, she said, oh, well, you guys are, you know, probably from out of town. Where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Minneapolis and I'm, I'm writing a story on the mining industry. And she looked scared. Uh, like that, that is, sounds a lot like I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, but then I just kind of said, you know, a lot of people don't understand how important mining is to the local economy up here. And then she was relieved and she, you know, she told us that a lot of her customers are, you know, people who work in the mines or they work in the supply industry. And you know, simply citing jobs numbers but excluding induced jobs excludes people like this third generation family that is um, you know, making it because of the economic impact of the mines up in Northeastern Minnesota. So you know, it's not even, you know, it's, it's important for evaluating the economic impact of mining but it's also an important gauge on the quality of life up there because you know, if you're going to just pretend that Main Street jobs don't exist because, you know, you don't want to include that in your mining report, then that's not really, you know, intellectually honest. Uh, so it, it excluded the benefits, but it also manufactured costs. So uh, the stock letter assumes that mining would result in a reversal of tourism in the Boundary Waters canoe area. It's, you know, currently growing at a rate of 1.2 to 2.4 percent. But this study, or this, sorry, not a study, this letter assumes that it's just going to reverse, even though it doesn't assume there will be any pollution from mining. Uh, and the footnote that supposedly supports this claim is a study from 1996 that looks at population growth in two northwestern Montana counties uh, from the Nixon administration through the Clinton administration. And I just don't think that that's a fair way of evaluating the impact of a modern mine 
uh, with you know advanced controls. Uh, and Debbie will talk about this in a little bit. So you should have looked at the Eagle Mine and the impact on tourism in Upper Michigan. So uh, the Eagle Mine is a primary nickel, copper, and cobalt mine. It's operated responsibly since 2014. And they even allow citizens to come in. There's a citizen monitoring group that looks at air quality, water quality, et cetera. And they kind of, you know, trust would verify with the information that the uh, company is providing to regulators in Michigan. And what we see in Michigan, uh, in Marquette County, there's been an increase in tourism jobs since the Eagle Mine started operating. So, you know, and this makes total sense because if you have an, a higher economic baseline, if you have, um, you know, year round employment with high paying jobs, you're going to see more employment in, you know, mostly tour tourism related businesses like restaurants um, and other recreational activities. So, uh, Debbie, you said you wanted to talk a little bit about how this affects uh, tourism in how mining helps tourism in Nevada. Well, that's that's right, Isaac. I mean, mining and tourism, not only can they coexist, but the mines themselves can actually become a tourist attraction. So as we talk about in, in our paper, the Flambeau Mine, which is located um, in Ladysmith, Wisconsin, during operation, it had a, it set up basically an observation platform where people could stand on this platform, which was above the mining area, the open pit mining area, and watch the mining happen. And the company uh, that operated the mine, Kennecott, estimated that over 100,000 people came to watch the mining operation during the four or five years that Flambeau was in operation. So the, the operation itself actually drew people into the area as tourists. Uh, the Eagle Mine in Michigan has a very robust program of summer tours where people can sign up and go see the mining operation. People find mining operations really quite fascinating. I mean, if you like big trucks and stuff, it's, it's wonderful to watch the big equipment operate. We have the same thing here in Nevada. Uh, when we don't have a pandemic, the several of the uh, bigger mining companies here in Nevada offer summer tours. And those tours are very, very popular because people, again, like to see the operation. They like to see the big equipment. They are fascinated by the technologies that are used. And so uh, not only can mining and tourism coexist, the mines themselves can become tourist attractions. Exactly. So Debbie, we're going to get into the environmental part of this section. So it's your time to shine. Tell us okay. all about the advancements in the regulations and okay. the technology. I will do that. And again, I'm going to kind of rush through this a bit. But if you want more details about the regulations, there's a lengthy discussion in our paper. So I've worked on mining projects, proposed mining projects throughout the country, and sometimes projects become uh, controversial and there's a lot of opposition to the projects. And in my experience, that opposition is always basically kind of the same story. Although the cast of characters changes and maybe their costumes change a bit, the plot line is pretty much the same because mining opponents typically look at mining operations somewhere else that happened many, many years ago and try to use the environmental problems at those sites to say, this is what's going to happen in the future if you let mine XYZ be permitted and go into operation. Um, and what they are doing is that they are basically looking at mines that are developed or were developed um, you know, even more than 100 years ago before there were any environmental regulations and trying to bootstrap the problems at those mines as if they will happen someplace else in the future. Kind of ignoring the fact that uh, there are regulations now, many state and federal regulations that apply to modern mining operations. So basically what they are doing is they are looking at a factory and the uh, environmental and worker health and safety uh, features of a factory that made Model T Fords, which at which time there were no environmental or worker safety provisions, and, and kind of trying to compare that to what would be in place at a Tesla factory today. So the takeaway is that by pointing to old pre-regulation mines in many other states, 
mining opponents do not provide any meaningful information about what would happen at a future copper nickel mine in Minnesota. Um, you know, their, their reliance on problems at old sites is simply not relevant to a thoughtful dialogue about a proposed mining operation in Miss Minnesota or anywhere else. And it's important to realize that the environmental statutory and regulatory framework in this country and in mining states really didn't start to be developed until the 1970s. So mines that were developed prior to the 1970s, by and large, were developed without any environmental controls. Mines that have been developed since 1970s have had to operate under a, a steadily increasing array of environmental protection regulations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, in our report, I took a really close look at the uh, mining environmental, mining regulations that are in place in Minnesota. Do you want to flip back to that other slide for just a second, if you could? Absolutely. Let me know when you want me to flip forward. Okay. I, I certainly will. And I, again, I want to assure the viewers here today in our webinar that Minnesota has a comprehensive and really effective environmental regulatory program in place um, that will ensure environmental protection at Minnesota mines. Again, I want to emphasize the fact that your regulators are exceptional in my mind in that they really have world-class expertise in understanding how the rocks in this Duluth Gabbro area where the copper nickel mines are and mineral resources are located, how those rocks interact with the environment and whether those rocks uh, produce acid mine drainage, which is typically one of the main environmental problems that people are concerned about at mines. Um, acid rock drainage is certainly a problem at old mines where nobody gave any consideration to how the rocks would interfere, interact with the environment. But today at a mine in Minnesota, before a mine can be put into produ uh, production, the regulators and the mining company will know very, very with great specificity how those rocks will interact with the environment, whether they will generate acid, and how, if they do generate acid, how that acid mine drainage can be controlled through modern environmental protection technology, water treatment, liners that contain any uh, waters that are affected by mined materials, and why the problems that occurred at mines elsewhere a long time ago won't be replicated at mines in the future in Minnesota. So again, mining's past does not preordain mining's future. And when you hear mining critics talk about problems at mines elsewhere, what they're really doing is they're looking in the rear view mirror. They're not looking forward. They're not considering what the, the environmental protection measures that will be in place at modern mines. They're looking at problems at old mines and trying to basically foment public concern about new mining based on what happened at old mines. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. All right, perfect. Yeah, it's a little like looking at the safety of cars before seatbelts and airbags. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. That's right. That's right. So there are three components of today's uh, modern environmental regulations in Minnesota, on the federal level, and in other states that really guarantee that mines are going to be safe for the environment, that the mines will be designed, built, operated, and uh, closed using effective and proven environmental safeguards that provide comprehensive environmental protection for all elements of the environment. So whether we're talking about wetlands, uh, surface water, groundwater, fish, uh, avian and terrestrial uh, wildlife, all of those things are taken into consideration in today's modern environmental regulations for mining. Secondly, uh, once permitting is completed for a mining operations, that's actually when the environmental oversight starts. It doesn't end once the permits are granted, but a, a mine permit will come with a long, long list of monitoring requirements that the mining companies will have to follow with great specificity to collect data to prove that the mine is operating uh, in compliance with all of its operating 
permits. So here you see some water quality data being collected. Um, mines have to collect data on the um, quality of wetlands, uh, air quality, um, many, many other types of environmental monitoring data that provide real-time information about how the mine is performing compared to the projections in its environmental permits. And if there's any deviation, if any of these monitoring data suggest, oh, maybe there's something that isn't quite like we expected, the regulations require the mining uh, company and regulators to look into any potential upsets or unexpected situations. And if that investigation indicates that there is a problem, the mining company has to fix it. And Minnesota's regulations um, actually very, have very specific parameters that if anything is detected that there could be an environmental issue, the mining company has to basically develop a study, fund the study, and provide financial assurance to guarantee that that study will be implemented uh, and executed. And then the third uh, part of today's environmental regulations that are um, extremely important in guaranteeing that today's mines will not become tomorrow's environmental problems is that modern mining regulations require mining companies to provide very substantial financial assurance. You might also hear this uh, referred to as a reclamation bond that guarantees that the mine will be reclaimed once mining is done. Now these reclamation bonds are calculated, the amount of the bond is calculated on the basis of the regulators having to do the work. So the premise of the bond is something happens to the company, they go bankrupt or for some other reason cannot reclaim the site, then the reclamation bonds guarantee that the regulators will have enough money using um, third party contractors and, and government uh, labor rates to fully reclaim the site and to monitor it for many years after reclamation to guarantee that the reclamation has been successful. Just to give you a couple of metrics on the size of the reclamation bonding programs that are in place today. Uh, in my state, again, in Nevada, uh, mining operations in aggregate have provided state and federal regulation regulators with over 3.2 billion, that's billion with a B, in financial assurance for Nevada's mines. Um, I believe the, the, poly, the bond for uh, PolyMet's NorthMet project is more than um, $500 million. So, you know, half, half a billion dollars. So these are substantial bonds and they provide an enormous um, safeguard to the public that any future mining will not be an environmental problem and certainly will not create any kind of future taxpayer liability in the event that there's an environmental issue or an unreclaimed site. That simply will not happen because of these financial assurance uh, mechanisms. Absolutely. So let's look at the track record of modern mining. So uh, Debbie, can you explain what this chart is, what it means, and why it's important to look forward? Sure. Thank, thanks, Isaac. So this chart speaks volumes about how effective modern mining regulations are in protecting the environment. Um, I compiled this data from uh, information from the uh, environmental, US Environmental Protection Agency. NPL stands for the National Priorities List. And that's the uh, list of sites um, that may at some point in the future become eligible for cleanup uh, using the US Superfund. And the NPL includes many, many sites that aren't mining sites. But what I've done here is I've shown the mining sites that are on the NPL and listed them according to um, chronology. And you'll see here that you know, the, the biggest spike of uh, NPL sites are those mines that were developed in the last half of the 19th century. So from the 1850s to uh, 1899, which is when many of the country's Western mining districts were first developed. So we had a real mining boom there, obviously no environmental protection regulations. And today there is a legacy of environmental problems from those 
old historic pre-regulation mines. A couple of the other spikes I like to point out on this graph are the spikes during uh, the 1941 to 1950s and 1951 to 1960. Those spikes correspond to World War II and the Korean War. And many of the mines that are on the uh, MPL list today during those time periods are mines that were actually operated by the federal government during these war efforts to, pro to, to provide the metals that were needed by the military to win these wars. So many of these mines have environmental reg uh, legacy issues associated with them. But again, those are well before the advent of today's mining regulations. So I mentioned earlier that today's regulations started to be developed in the 1970s, and you can see a great uh, reduction in the number of NPL sites in the 70s and the 80s, none in the 90s. There's one in the 1990 to 2000 timeframe, but the EPA considers that mine, it's a mine in South Carolina, to actually be a pre-regulation mine because it was developed before South Carolina had implemented its mining regulations in the 1990s. And since then, we haven't seen any sites that have gone on to the national priorities list. And I believe that that speaks to the really effective um, nature of today's environmental protection regulations and bonding requirements for mining. Yeah, and that's obviously that's amazing news because it means that we can responsibly develop our natural resources. And this is what the Flambeau mine that Debbie was talking about earlier looks like or looked like on the left during operation and on the right is what it looks like today. Um, so it's been reclaimed. It's a nature area. There's horse trails and there's also an industrial park that's left over from uh, some of the buildings in the, you know, you have all these utilities that are sent to the or built in this area. And the community can continue to benefit from that investment long after the mine has closed down. Um, so I'm just going to jump to this. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this part uh, just because it's in the new paper and I want you all to read it and we want to have time for Q&A and be respectful of Debbie's time as well. Uh, so for challenges to more mining in Minnesota, the main challenges aren't environmental or scientific. Uh, I would argue that they are political. Um, the Biden administration may pick up where the Obama administration left off. Uh, canceling mineral leases and politicizing permitting processes for uh, projects and delaying them to death. Uh, the DFL State Central Committee passed a resolution supporting a moratorium on copper nickel mining. So, you know, the DFL party is moving further away from, you know, supporting responsible mining. And bad energy policy is driving up the cost of doing business in the state of Minnesota. Uh, so, uh, essentially, what happened in 2016 uh, in the final days of the Obama administration is that the um, Department of Agriculture, I believe it was, withdrew the um, mineral permits or the, yeah, the, the mineral leases for twin metals in the Superior National Forest. And, you know, even Amy Klobuchar uh, wrote to Secretary Vilsack and said, look, you guys did not follow the process on this. Uh, emails obtained from the Wall Street Journal said, or found that Klobuchar said, uh, either a judge is going to reverse this decision or the Trump administration will. So um, she called it, uh, well, Kim Strassel called it a midnight kiss to green environmentalists, but Amy Klobuchar said, you guys sure got a good headline in the New York Times. So that was an instance where politics trumped science or process uh, in mineral leasing in Northern Minnesota. And these mineral leases were uh, restored by the Trump administration. And now Twin Metals has submitted a formal mine plan. So that wouldn't have happened under a, a Clinton administration, frankly. Um, and you know, the DFL has moved more toward its urban core, its urban base, and further away from the people that work with their hands and produce things. Um, so, uh, you know, they primaried a pro-mining state senator in Duluth. That was uh, Eric Simonson. Uh, Tom Bach was replaced as a majority leader by Susan Kent. Um, the party endorsed the moratorium on copper nickel mining. And uh, Congressman Omar told a labor leader, look, you guys are going to have to learn a different industry. And you know, those things don't go over well. I mean, it's, it's, it really just kind of shows the disconnect. And, you know, up in the corner here, we have Debbie, or Debbie, uh, Betty McCallum on her phone, and she uses these minerals as much as anybody, yet she's the one introducing legislation in Congress to stop mining in the Superior National Forest. So there's just been a disconnect. And, you know, the Walls administration has politicized the permitting process for line three, so, you know, this whole follow the science mantra doesn't instill a lot of confidence. 
Uh, and lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about energy policy because mining is a hugely energy intensive industry. Uh, iron mines and paper mills used 8% of all the electricity generated in the state of Minnesota in 2018. And our report doubling down on failure found that a 50% renewable energy mandate, which is half of what the Walls administration wants to implement, would cost these mining industries $200 million every year, which is about 2,400 or no, 2,040 high paying mining jobs. And, and really the thing about it is uh, they need this electricity and they need it to be affordable. And uh, the, the groups that don't like mining in Minnesota are really pushing to retire the Boswell power plant up in Cohasset because that is the power plant that makes mining possible. So if they get rid of that power plant, they get a twofer. They get to say, we're saving the planet from climate change and we're shutting down the mining industry. So. In my opinion, the Boswell power plant needs to stay open. It's a matter of national security, but that's just my opinion. And it's really important to remember that Minnesota produces 85% of the iron ore in the country, but that's only about 2% of the global total. So other countries have lower you know, costs because they don't care about the environment or they don't care about their workers the way that we do. So if we continue to make our industries less competitive with those abroad, it's really easy for that 2% that we produce to get absorbed by some other country. So now I'd like to open it to questions. Sorry I rushed through that last part, but I did want to make sure we had time for Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Isaac and Debbie. That was terrific. We've got a bunch of questions. We won't have time to get to all of them. And some of them have been answered as the presentation went on. Um, Early on, uh, somebody asked, has there ever been a copper mine in Minnesota before? I don't think there has yet. Is, is that right? Uh, no, not in Minnesota. Uh, there was gold mines. Uh, that was one of the original draws to the Iron Range, actually. It was a gold rush in Vermilion. Um, Debbie, do you know anything about the Dunka pit? Because I believe that that was also um, looking for non-iron minerals, but I think that this would be the first modern large-scale copper mine in the state. I think, that, I think that's correct, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know anything uh, in, in specificity about that pit. Right. Here's a question uh, that's very specific, and I don't know if you guys know the answer. I certainly don't, but, but one of our viewers asks, do you know why Anglo Gold exited Minnesota and abandoned their leased exploration acres was it inadequate AU results in their core samples or unfavorable Minnesota governmental policy? They were serious about it and spent some real money. Do you happen to know the answer to that question? I don't think it was bad policy. Um, I think that, I don't know. I, that'd be a great question for Anglo. I don't know the specifics, but um, you know, I don't think they had any problem with their drilling program or anything like that. And I could be wrong. Debbie, do you know anything about that? I don't, but I will say in general that, you know, mining companies um, work, especially a company like Anglo Gold has operations worldwide and uh, they have to make decisions about where the best place to operate is. And they have, you know, make those decisions kind of weighing the merits of a given project versus the other projects in their portfolios. So it would be interesting to know whether they had concerns about the resource there or if there were policy concerns, but I, I don't have any specific knowledge about that. We have a, uh, a guest today named Scott Beauchamp. If, if this was talk radio, he'd be referred to as a seminar caller, appears to be a, a professional activist of sorts. But he asked the question, is the clean mine in Wisconsin, you are referring to the Flambeau mine, because it has actually been determined that Flambeau did pollute through independent scientific review. Debbie, can you comment on that? Well, our paper talks about a, pro, a, a, a situation that the regulators and um, the company are still monitoring, but it's not a significant problem there. And uh, I, I think that the situation at Flambeau really documents that a mine can be developed, it can be repurposed into something that is a very important um, element of the community so that the, the community is benefited not just from the uh, mining operation, but has continues to benefit from the presence of that industrial um, park and the wildlife preserve 
I believe probably the issue that uh, Mr. Beauchamp is referring to is that there has been some elevated copper that has been noted in some water quality samples that is believed to be due to um, some spilled ore during the transportation of the ore offsite. But it's not a large problem and notwithstanding, the company is still involved in talking to regulators about it. Here's a question that it's uh, very specific and technical. Uh, one of our viewers says, I believe it is, it is important to discuss the rock mechanics in the area that will be mined, i.e. the rock is extremely fine grained and competent. That is not allowing any passage of water as was determined by core samples. Is that something that you look at as an environmental uh, expert, Debbie? Oh, absolutely. So I, I think that conversation, that question is, is pertaining perhaps to hydrology and, and whether or not you have rocks that can transmit water or rocks that are very impermeable. Um, and you can have both kinds of rocks at, at mining operations. Um, I think the important point is that part of the environmental baseline work that has to be done at any mine site is an extensive hydrology study so that um, the mining companies and the regulators have a very, very good understanding of how water moves through the environment in the underground. Um, rock mechanics can also be a term that's applied to the actual physical strength um, of, of the rocks as it relates to um, how a pit wall would behave, for example. So that's also another area of investigation. Most people would consider that to be a, a geotechnical investigation, not quite an environmental investigation, but still there would be tremendous amount of data that would be collected to prove that the mine features that will be developed will be able, will be um, engineering fe engine feasible from an engineering perspective and, and safe for the environment. Well, let's see here. We have some questions that have come in here in just the last couple of minutes, and I'm just scrolling through to see if we can get one or two more uh, in under the wire here. There's been a question about a couple of questions about reclamation bonds. And Debbie, it looks like you actually typed an answer here uh, to a couple of the, a couple of, of our viewers are wondering about the duration of reclamation bonds. You know, how long do they last? Is there a plot? Do you have to keep paying premiums? Is, is there a, a risk there? Can you just answer that real quickly, Debbie? I, I sure can. So these bonds last through the entire life of the mine, not just during operation, but during closure and reclamation. And the mining companies are responsible for maintaining those bonds in good standing so that they pay annual premiums. Additionally, the regulators often require those bonds to be updated to keep pace with inflation. And the regulators keep the bonds until the regulators are absolutely certain that the site is fully reclaimed and closed to their satisfaction. So regulators are in the driver's seat. And I will add that in many jurisdictions, um, these bonding requirements can also include a requirement for a um, trust fund or other long-term financial assurance mechanisms that can provide essentially funds in perpetuity. So for example, if the closure plan uh, shows that it's going to be necessary to operate a water treatment facility for many, many years after the mine has been closed, then as part of the financial assurance obligation for that project, the mining company will have to develop a trust and the state or the federal and or federal agencies will be the beneficiary of that trust to provide sufficient funds to essentially operate that water treatment facility in perpetuity. We are uh, up at uh, against our uh, end, end time here of one o'clock and so I think we will uh, call it a day for now. Thank you very much, Isaac and uh, Debbie, and thanks to all of our viewers for participating. And I believe that uh, th th this, this, well, for one thing, this recording will be archived so that people will be watch able to watch it in the future. 
and uh, I think everybody who registered will get uh, either the video or the slideshow or some combination of the two emailed later in the day. So thank you all for participating. And with that, we will conclude the program.